Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Everyday Trader. Good to be with you. This is Greg Jensen, CEO of Options Animal. Glad to be with you again, Eric. Oh, yeah. It's good to be here, everybody. Little slap and a fist pump. Nice. <laughs> I did jujitsu this morning. I roll with a guy who's a cop. So he's on a local police force and he teaches hand to hand combat to, to cheat to other, um, other police officers. So he is always really fun. He comes up with some really tricky stuff and does all kinds of weird things to me. <laughs> so that sounds really entertaining. I want to just come and watch. It, it probably is pretty fun to watch. I was in some really <laughs> awkward pretzel positions. So some people, there's some nicknames for jujitsu. Um, one of them is murder yoga. So I, I think that goes along. It's involuntary yoga. So you get like you get some pretty good stretching. Your body gets contorted and legs go in places and arms go in places they don't normally go. So I'm feeling a limber this morning. So, yeah. You know, that might be a good um, description of what's going on with bank stocks today is a contorted pretzel formation <laughs> or murder Yoda. Maybe there's another <laughs> that the uh, obviously the story of the day today is the continued crisis in regional banks. Uh, last week, you know, we had JP Morgan uh, step in and save a bank. Um, this week, we have more uh, that are in need of saving. Uh, Pacific Western Bank, uh, of course, is the spotlight today. Western What's Alliance the stock is down that again. PACW, is that it? PACW, yeah. And, you know, the concern, of Oof. course, is this is not over, that the Fed has raised interest rates so fast that these banks are all in trouble because of the Fed. And it's an interesting argument right now, because on one hand, I agree, I can see that we had a kind of an unprecedented move in interest rates over the last 15 months. We've gone from zero to 5% in 15 months on the Fed funds rate. And that's unprecedented, the speed at which we've raised rates. And so in one sense, I can say, yeah, maybe some of the, the, uh, the onus is on the Fed. But on the other hand, it's not like the Fed hasn't telegraphed what they're doing either. I mean, they've been very upfront of, we are raising rates, our number one, we have two mandates, and that is to battle inflation or price stability, and employment and employment's still really good. I mean, we saw that this week with the, we'll, we'll really see tomorrow, I guess. I don't want to jump ahead because I want to make sure and talk about this bank situation. I want your take on it. But in, in one sense, the feds telegraphed what they've been doing. They told us we're raising rates. We're raising rates. Why have these banks who have duration risk on these bonds that they're holding, why have they not hedged? They, I don't know. they should maybe, know how to do it, right? Maybe, maybe you want to channel your own grumpy old man. These kids today don't understand uh, an environment, <laughs> right? Before we started, you were you were commenting that, I mean, really, anybody that started trading in since two thousand and eight, really, I mean, that's how long is fifteen years? I mean, they've not. We've been in this zero interest rate policy since the end of two thousand eight. Uh, we had this little freak out thing that happened in 2018 and 19. And here we are back again, looking at the Fed funds rate. Um, you know, we've not been there before. If, of course, if you go back and look at this, and it's actually, a, I would say a layman, somebody who uh, doesn't look at this as much as I do was commenting. And they're like, you know, aren't we like, if you look at a long-term thing, are we like right in the middle of where we've been for like long-term history? Yeah. But you know, these you have these things that businesses change the way they do business. And, you know, you go back to this, the Fed has has broadcasted their intentions pretty clearly. And I, I was going to comment, you know, we saw the Federal Reserve statement here. So this is this is their statement, a pretty straightforward, concise statement. And this thing gets sliced and diced. So I did a, a, a find and compare to. Um, the last one. So this is the May statement. March is the one before. Really minor changes in this. Um, you know, so recent indicators point to, as opposed to economic activity expanded at a modest pace, 
instead of growth. And, and so really subtle changes. And this is the one that seems to have gotten people. They went from the committee, the committee anticipates some additional policy firming may be appropriate in order to attain, attain a stance of monetary policy that's sufficiently restrictive to return to 2%, as opposed to in determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate to return to a 2%. It's a really, really subtle change. And this is, this is, these lines here are what people are taking as a pause. And I think there's, if anything, a hat tip to, yeah, we know uh, things, <laughs> things are, um, you know, getting tight and we will stop eventually and it'll still be data dependent. I mean, I don't, I don't think this is a subtle change, but yet I read the Wall Street Journal and, and Barron's and everybody says, you know, Fed, Fed and other analysts and, and um, as well as economists saying the Fed signals a pause. Did you take away a pause from this? I mean, if you listen to the words. No, I didn't. I mean, and, you know, to go back to what I was, what you referenced earlier, you know, we don't have, uh, the, the characters, I had to just do a Google search because I'd forgotten their names. It was the Duke brothers, Mortimer and Randolph, the two brothers from Trading Places, right? The old yeah. guys. That's we, we need. This is your more. second Trading Places reference of the day. I, Trading Places to me is still the greatest investment movie of all time. If you have not read it, I know a lot of people like the big short and <laughs> there were some, there's some fantastic uh People in the Big Short. I thought um, oh, yeah, that's great Steve argument. Carell did a fantastic job oh, yeah. Yeah, in the Big awesome. Short. But anyway, but no, uh, Trading Places is still trading movie of all time. If you have Wolf of Wall Street, that, Wolf of Wall Street, even oh. better than Wall Street. I like Wall Street, but to Wall, me, no, but Wolf of Wall, the Wolf of Wall Street. That was the, yeah, I mean, yeah, Margot yeah, Robbie. You sure. can't watch it. That's, 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 okay. That's, that's okay. That's probably crossing the line. <laughs> <laughs> So but you're anyway, right. I, I would I, I would put Trading Places at, at the top of my list as one of my all time favorites. Um, you know that we did a summit one time and I played that uh, while we were waiting around for some stuff. That's right. That's right. So no. So back to the, the concern is yeah the people running banks portfolios have they've never seen this. We've never seen a Fed who has had to battle inflation because those we haven't done it. We haven't battled inflation since the late seventies. People who are trading in the late 70s are retired, or if they're even still around with us, to be honest. I mean, that was 50 years ago. And so because we, maybe they just didn't believe the Fed. And so, yes, banks are in trouble. I'm not saying that those uh, solu- or those situations are not going to potentially cause some issues down the road. And so we're really kind of in a rocky situation, I think, that the Fed still has to conquer inflation. I mean, the jobs report, the ADP report this week shows that the job market is still strong. What if we get a blowout jobs number tomorrow? Like bullish, awesome, wage growth is increasing, wage inflation is increasing. What's the Fed going to have to do? They, they, they can't back off of controlling inflation. We talked about that in our last reporting. That would be the biggest mistake the Fed could make is to pause and then have to start up again because oh. they let inflation get out of control again. Yeah, we I, saw I think a, rather air to the downside. They, they don't have to care about it, the S&P. Yeah, so people talk about this ADP report and criticize it. I mean, ADP is the largest payroll processor and they, they have a pretty good, they do a pretty good job. I, I think historically their number... Um, got a rap for rap for being a volatile, but it's um, I think they've worked out the methodology and I think it's gotten better. They've changed how they do the calculation, but ADP coming in at um, was it 296? Yeah. 296 blew everybody out of the water. That was way higher than people expected. Now, of course, yesterday we did get unemployment claims that were slightly higher, but only by like 13,000. So that, that number is a little bit choppy here. Everybody's waiting for tomorrow and what's going to happen. Now, Powell did comment. People asked about, he, he said, I don't think that wage pressure is the reason that we have the inflation problem. Now, he says that it contributes overall to prices, but it's not just wages. But certainly tomorrow, there's going to be a lot of uh, focus on that. And the Fed's two mandates, we said this a dozen times here on this 
this forum is to get moderate inflation and maximum employment. And they're okay with unemployment going a little bit higher from here, not politically correct, but they've got a lot of air cover. And I think they won't really have to defend themselves until we see a high fives. So 5.5, 5.8. I think a high, a good number tomorrow, if we stay under 4% unemployment and you know some of the other numbers come in in line as expected. I mean, I, I, my probabilities, looking at these probabilities of a Fed rate, I, I think they're disconnected from reality. I think there's, there was a quote um, yesterday from, or I guess it was before the Fed on Wednesday, earlier in the day. Oh, no, no, no. I know it was curvature report. Uh, curvature report um, said we need to focus on what we think the Fed is going to do, not what we want the Fed to do. And I yeah, think I, I, I agree with that. That's we, we need to focus on what the Fed we, what we think they're going to do. And then you add that dynamic to another dynamic that happened this week since our last recording is that Secretary Yellen said, we're going to run out of money on June, June 1st. Oh, yeah, that happened this week, too. Um, uh, and and so you throw that debt ceiling drama that I'm not as big of, and you and I have both said the same thing. I'm, I'm not concerned the debt, the debt ceiling will get raised eventually. The question is, how much will the S and P drop while the politicians are arguing, trying to get it done? How, how long are we shut down? You know, is it, is it reminiscent of 2011 where we had a 20% drawdown in the market while we were waiting for the debt ceiling drama to get settled I, I don't know i hope not but you throw that on top of our banking crisis at, at smaller regionals right Let, let's make sure that we clarify jp morgan just made a haul with their with their acquisition of first republic uh it was like two what, they're estimating 2.6 billion dollars you know one-time profit that, that jp morgan's gonna get from that so you know jp morgan's fine bank of america is fine wells fargo is fine Citigroup is weird i don't understand city group but yeah there's back to your uh you know what brett donnelly said there well and shared, brett shared this, this but this actually came from mike bostick um doing some simple coding here and he shared the code but this is the plot i love these visuals i love these infographics and we're looking at the size of these or the size the you know the capital of the bank and um, you can see each one of these. So there's lots of failures. And I, I heard this narrative. And I think this is this addresses the narrative that you're hearing is banks fail all the time. We just haven't seen any. It's only been three banks. Like, yeah, but Brent Donnelly said this looks like a gnome and snowman. And just looking at the size of these three banks, so Signature, Silicon Valley, First Republic, and probably add Pac West on here uh, is a big deal. Uh, I, I, I think... Um, you know, that we have so many regional banks and I was popping up that KRE. This is the regional banking ETF, which has just been absolutely decimated. I and mean, we've got a haircut of about 50% that's happened as of today. I think there's some, probably some opportunity for trading in here. Uh, regional banks cannot go away. I know that, and I, I don't even think the big banks, I don't think JP Morgan City, Bank of America, Who's the other one that I'm thinking of? There's the four big banks. I don't, they, I don't think they want to see the regional banks gone. I think they want to see, we, and we need regional banks because that's important. And this is directly impacting, this is why you're seeing IWM or the, uh, the Russell 2000 index getting beaten because it's these small components of the Russell 2000 that rely heavily on you know financing, which is mostly through local banks. So that's this the situation needs to get resolved. I think it's recognized and understood. And the Fed has, as they keep saying, they have tools and, and treasury as well to to help the banks get through this. I, I'm taking this on faith because I don't want to see another crisis. But I do remember what happened in 2007 and 2008 when we were seeing chinks in the armor of some of the what had been icons and you know, Lehman Brothers could never imagine Lehman going away. And um, so I, at the time, I know a lot of people were saying the same thing. Oh, don't worry. Calm down, everybody. Be chill. You know, we're going to get through this. Now, is this a different time? I, it is a different time. It's a different reason what's happening. 
And um, I think there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. I think there's opportunity here. I don't know where it is, but I wanted to share this chart that um, from our friends at Strategus Research. Uh, this, this is a graph of what happens after the Fed's last hike. And we don't know that this one's the last one, right? So we, the Fed didn't say they're going to pause. <laughs> they, they, they made some moderate changes in recognizing that there have been some changes. So, But if they do pause, looking at these uh, eight different periods since 74, average return is 13% from the date of the last increase. So it, unless we have you know one, a 74 or an 00 um, or 2000, um, we're probably in slate, I mean, in, in store for a bullish run that's really going to get people, uh, it, it's, we're going to climb a wall of worry as people are in denial. I, I think there's opportunity here. I don't know. I haven't, I wouldn't wave the all clear yet. I think we need to get through some stuff. Uh, wait until Fed starts speaking again. I'd love to be able to see another PCI report and or CPI report and a PCE report, of course, jobs report on Friday to get some indication on that. But I think in the next few weeks, we should get some clarity. Um, if we, the best of all worlds would be a moderate increase in unemployment, inflation coming down a little bit more than people expected. Um, I think watch out because I think the market's going to take off if that happens. Yeah, I think I'm, I I think I can get behind that optimism. I think a lot of it's going to depend on um, the consumer being able to hang on to their optimism. I mean, there's been a lot of focus on the fear around these these small medium banks. And I heard a stat as I was dropping my daughter off at school school this morning. I was listening to CNBC. And <gasps> you were listening 40, to CNBC. Yeah, I know. Crazy, right? Um, 48% of Americans right now are concerned about the stability of their deposits in their bank accounts. That's a pretty alarming stat. Now, it's not quite more than 50%, but the fact that almost 50% of, the, of Americans right now are concerned about the stability of their, the safety of their bank account, that's a, that's a concern right now. So, I we think it's a concern that. that it's that low. I think it should be 80 or 90%. I think yeah, everybody maybe. should be a little concerned. Maybe. The other people are clu clueless. I think yeah. everybody should be concerned. I think uh, most people are clueless right now. And so if we can restore consumer confidence and you know get some solid earnings reports to still come out, because let's be honest, there's still a lot of leftover savings from the COVID stimulus. That people are hanging on to. There is still an enormous amount of liquidity that's just hanging out in the system that I, I'm not one of the super pessimists that thinks there's this massive recession coming because I still think there's a lot of money in the system. Um, I, I'm still of the camp that inflation still is the bigger issue um, and the Fed needs to keep tightening, but I, I know I'm not popular in that side either. Uh, I think people are saying that the Fed is clueless because they don't have a very good track record. Let's be honest. Uh, the, the transitory word has kind of been one that has kind of bit them for a while. One other thing that I think could restore confidence is we're getting today, and we haven't talked about it yet. We get Apple earnings after the bell, and they are the leader, clearly, in the in the financial world. Did you see? I think I tweeted this yesterday. No, it was in a trade I did yesterday. They're the leader in the financial world. I, I they think. are. They, they are a bank now, right? They, they got a billion dollars in deposits in four days to that savings account program that they opened. Um, that's really interesting. Uh, I think that's the bigger risk. The ri that that is the risk to banks. By the way, is I went you know by the way I went down and sat Trader Oasis. We've got a stack of capital that's been sitting there not making any money. And I met with banker and I'm like, this is ridiculous. And he's like, yeah, happy to help you out. I mean, there's options out there. You know, money market funds four and a half percent. Like, just why not? So pulling that money out and putting it into um, T bills or someplace else. And they were very happy to accommodate me and keep the money in that bank. Um, sure. They weren't going to reach out to me, but you've got a you've got se very seamless transactions right now. That's the one thing that's different with these bank runs is that they can happen in milliseconds because you can set up your Venmo or whatever an instant um, move funds between accounts. And so, 
go setting up an Apple savings account. It's already linked to your account. Boom, let's move over 10,000 bucks. And when you start getting that happening, that bank run uh, happens pretty quick. And I guess maybe that is, you know, what we're looking at here is potentially a black swan event because black swan events are things that uh, are not necessarily volatile events. So black swan events are all volatile. Not all volatile events are black swans. So a black swan is a very specific definition. Uh, it's something that's not been analyzed or seen before. So a global pandemic is not a black swan. It was a very volatile event. That is true. But we've seen it before. And so we should know the what happened with credit default swaps and repackaging mortgages was something we had never seen before. We changed the risk profile. That's why the financial crisis. And Taleb says, hey, listen, I didn't predict the financial crisis. Nassim Taleb came up with a black swan book and he gets credited with like, oh, you predicted. He's, I didn't predict it. I just happened to write the book that came out right before the crash. And so he just said that, you know, things that we haven't thought about are going to happen. And so right now, I think the banking thing, we don't really fully understand the extent of the speed at which money can move in and out of banks. That's the problem I think that's going on here. And it is related to the Fed, the Fed raising rates now. And shame on the banks for not getting ahead of this. This is what it takes is the banks need to find, hey, listen, you've got money in your checking account. You're not making money. You've got an opportunity for you here. You can make 3% or 4% or 5% or whatever it is. Don't move your money. That's what the banks need to be doing. That's what they need to do. And yeah. they, I mean, I'm not smart enough to know why they aren't doing that, but other banks are. If Apple, you say Apple's got a billion dollars in the past four days? In four days, billion dollars into their their savings account program that they, they opened. And honestly, that's you, you said it really well. Shame on the banks for being greedy because ultimately what people are finally realizing is they're looking, they're doing exactly what you just did um, with your bank account, where you said you looked at the the amount of money that's sitting, even in a savings account, earning 0.1% interest, because that's all they've had to offer for the last 15 years, banks have, because there was no other alternative. Now there are alternatives to move capital somewhere else, but banks are not actively trying to retain their clients by going to them and saying, hey, you know what, let's switch you into a higher interest earning account because you know we want to help you out as a, as a bank. We want to help you, you know, we see your money doing nothing in your checking account. Let's help you out and move that. And they're, re and they're falling prey to the fact that, like you said, it's so easy to move capital out somewhere else to say, I'm going to go put my money at Apple or SoFi or just move it from, you know, this regional bank that's doing nothing for me to I'm going to go move it to JP Morgan because they're offering this 4% savings account that is way better than the 0 0.1 that I've gotten for the last decade. Yeah, and bank, in my opinion, the reason banks have not done it is greed because they know by doing that, they're going to lose some of the profit margin that they've been making on that capital that's been sitting in their accounts for so long. I got to hope that they're smart enough to see this coming. And, and we're, I mean, but who knows? I mean, it all, I think a lot of it comes down to incentives and, you know, however people are incentivized, if people are incentivized based on returns or I, I think looking at the long term, retaining those customers, because what's happened is the barriers to exit are have come down. And it's it used to be if you wanted to close out a bank, you're going to take a day off from work, you're going to go down and you're going to meet with somebody and fill out a bunch of paper and get a check and the hassle of going and move it. You know, the barriers were sufficiently high. Now you can open an account in you know just seconds, and then just with a few clicks, you can you can move um, a significant amount of money uh, around. Um, yeah, so I, I think that that's a that dynamic is just something that didn't exist before, and I think it's part of the reason why we know that's a silver. That's exactly what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. Is right. it was a it was a this is Waller's words one hundred percent a run on the bank. So this, I mean, this was, you know, it's a wonderful life, Bailey Savings and Loan, everybody coming in and say, give me my money back. And if that didn't happen, the bank probably would have been fine. So, um, I, you know, the banks, hopefully they're smart enough to see this and, um, yeah. We'll see. Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll see. Pay attention to it the next few days. Hopefully Apple will come out with some good earnings after the bell and give a little boost to the market and we get a, 
Goldilocks jobs report tomorrow so that we don't uh, sell into the weekend. Otherwise, we could have a rocky day tomorrow, too. We'll see. I did want to talk real quick. Uh, we we got a little bit off the subject here, and that is the Fed funds rate future. So back to the Fed funds, you know, there's CME tool that a lot of people look at uh, that, you know, extrapolate probability. So we've moved to this 500 to 525 uh, rate. And so the probability for next June is that we're, you know, there's a 10% chance that we're going to cut, and also roughly a 90% chance we stay. And as you go further out in time, you see that there's probabilities that shift lower that show a potential rate cut. And people will often refer to this other tab here, these probabilities showing where the futures are and um, where the probability ranges are, the greatest probability. These are very subjective. The way that this these are calculated are based on these futures. So these are the fit, the 30 day fed fund futures. And um, it's the price change of these that they're able to extrapolate these probabilities. Now I've read the white paper a couple of times and there's a couple of really big assumptions. Now these fed futures are traded by institutions that have exposure. So mostly institutions that have exposure to the Fed funds rate, and they use these as hedging instruments and trying to go through the machinations of what is somebody thinking? Are they buying? Are they selling? What do they? What does it mean? Is it going to go up or down? I think there's a lot there, but I just wanted to point one thing out that's really important is we're calculating numbers out in the future here based on these volumes and open interest. So for example, this, this September future here has a current open interest of 40,000. Okay. So trading today is 27,000. Look at these other numbers here. We're talking hundreds of thousands. And as we go out further in time, we've got very low volume and open interest. And so when you have low volume and open interest, you really don't, you tend not to have great liquidity and really not clarity on the price. So we're extrapolating based on the changes of these prices, some probabilities. I'm just throwing out there that there's a lot of room for error, that people look at this number and say, oh, the market is pricing in a price cut. Um, yeah, that's, I, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you could extrapolate it from this data, but uh, I mean, we should all pray that the Fed doesn't cut because we have this graph that shows what happens to the stock market after the Fed pauses. The bars, I'll go. The I, I, I'll find this for the next one and show what happens when the rate cuts. It all the bars are negative, so we absolutely do not want rate cuts. This would be a very bad thing, and maybe that's what we're seeing in the Fed future or in the VIX futures. This risk that's in the future that people are thinking we're going to be in a deep recession second half of the year. Um, I, I think it, it recession 2024. To be honest with you, I think indicators are are. And I'll change my mind if the data changes. But I just want to tell people that, um, you know, we need to stop. There's the sensational stuff that we see. On t I, I feel bad if I had to be a CNBC and I had to fill 12 hours a day of content. I don't know that we could do that. <laughs> and yeah, you, me too. I mean, it's you, you end up having to ultimately rely on pitching fear to drive infomercials or to drive commercial sales. And it gets tiring. Breaking news, well. more after this, after you watch this commercial from Pfizer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Pfizer says, thank you very much. And you tune in to find out that Apple updated their privacy policy. <laughs> and and that's not to say that, there, that some of these issues that we're talking about aren't real issues. They, they are. Um, but I think you have to step back and look at the big picture sometimes and say, we're an economy that's at full employment that has still a lot of capital sitting in bank accounts of not just the banks, but other businesses around the world and around the, the United States. I, I think we're going to be okay uh, for now. And in the meantime, if, they're, if we're not, I'll, I'm, I'm glad I know how to do a collar trade, right? Exactly. Collar trade, which brings me to uh, the conversation that I wanted to have with you. And that is, oh, hold on. Give me a uh, trying to get there quickly. Apple earnings after the close today. Um, where are you um, on in terms of your thoughts on what's going to happen with Apple? 
uh, investor relations. There you go. Well, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Okay. So, you know, my opinion on Apple is that there's a lot of really good news already priced into the stock. I mean, the, this, this stock is, we're at 170, or we were at 170 just two days ago. Yeah. Uh, actually, just yesterday, we were at 170. Um, you know, this, this, we've come up from 125 uh, at the start of the year. So part of me says we, we got really good earnings already priced into the stock. Um, and we're a little expensive. And I've seen a few, I'm particularly referencing the Qualcomm number that was earlier this week. Qualcomm announced earnings and um, kind of got beat up on the news because it wasn't so much the news. It was their forecast was a little dismal about phone sales. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so. Yikes. Yeah, that that Ooh. that's not posting a really comforting picture. And I'm... It, <laughs> Remember, Qualcomm is not the, the sole supplier for Apple, um, but but the general theme they said was that phone sales are one of the things they're concerned about going forward. So I think it drug Apple down a little bit yesterday. It'll be interesting. I, I'm probably more in the bear camp with Apple for the reaction to this earnings report, because I think they've already priced in really good news. And for them to overcome the already priced in good news, they really have to beat. And maybe they will. I hope they do. I'd, I'd love if they gapped up. But my feeling is we're going to see more of like a, you know, four to five, maybe even a 10% correction in Apple before I'm going to get optimistic of saying it's time to get back into a share position in Apple. Currently, I just have a couple option trades on Apple. I'm actually, I have zero shares of Apple right now. What? Actually, I have one share. I take that back. Which actually, no, let me take that back. It is, it's hanging on my wall. Oh. I bought, I bought a share in like 2009 or something like that, 2007, that has gone through like a bunch of stock splits. So I want to say it's like 24 shares oh, nice. is officially what it is, but it's just in a frame on my wall. So that's my only equity position in Apple. I have wow. some option trades. I, I don't think I have. I mean, I'm, I'm shocked because I think you almost always trade Apple. I have, uh, I have a I trade. I have a trade for this earnings event, but I'm actually out of my shares right now. I, what is your trade? My trade is actually a uh, ratioed bear put. I thought it was a calendar strangle or something. Didn't oh, you do I those too? Because you shared with the Trader Oasis community a calendar strangle. So that that is a, a long call and a long put in different expirations, right? Yes. So not a calendar. You know what? I'm sorry. I am sharing the wrong trade. It is a calendar strangle on Apple. Okay. That's my trade on Apple. So I've got a leap long call at start in January 2025. My ratioed um, put spread is actually on the SPY. Sorry. Okay. All right. So I have a I have a bear call diagonal that I shared with the community earlier in the week on Apple. So a trade that does well in a stagnant trend with a rising implied volatility, um, a stagnant to bears trend. So that trade's gonna, I'm gonna close that for a profit today. My intention was to close it before earnings, but I do own shares that are naked right now. So just shares. My cost basis is much lower. I think we're down around 145 is my cost basis. But I'm probably going to take a cue from you and collar trade it. So the collar trade is hands down. It's our favorite trade. And I'm going to tell you that you're probably listening to me. So I don't want to do the collar trade. Listen, it is hands down the most versatile strategy that you can make money literally in any direction and off of changing time, changing implied volatility, changing stock price. You can choose to, to leverage any one of those, all of those. It is hands down the most versatile the reason that I love it is that you've got long stock, which eventually doesn't have any theta decay. Even if you're using options, no matter which option you have, it eventually theta comes to be an issue that you need to address. So buying long in the money calls. And I think you can, you know, if I was uh, perfect and being or, or better and being able to prognosticate the direction, using options only you um, definitely will have better results. But the problem is your losses can be bigger as well. I just think with a collar trade, you have the ability to, to really 
dial in. And uh, we talked about it a few times here. And that's, there's different structures of a collar trade. A collar trade is simply a long stock, a short call, and a long put. Sounds very simple, but there's literally a, at least a hundred different ways to structure that depending on whether you're going in the money, at the money, or out of the money, or if you want to go short-term, intermediate, or long-term, and all of those dynamics. So just, just think of a call can be at the money, can be in the money, can be out of the money, and it could be short, intermediate, or long. That, that gives you a matrix of three by three. There's nine choices there. With the long put, you have the same thing. You can buy a short-term long put and in the money, at the money, out of the money, short, intermediate, or long-term. That's nine different strikes or different, just basic nine different ways to buy a protected put. Nine times nine is 81. And then throw in the fact that you could maybe just be in a covered call or maybe just be in a long put only. Um, that actually is 10. So that's literally a hundred different collar trades and they all behave a little bit differently. You don't have to learn a hundred different collar trades to understand how those change, but you should understand the consequence of changing the the strike in terms of the moneyness in at and out of the money and then the expiration. Uh, and so I can structure a trade. I'm, my plan is to, I'm going to take a look at pricing right now, but I like your idea. I'm, I'm thinking a bearish collar is what I want to be in before the end of the day today. Something that'll make money if, if Apple goes down. Um, but I'm probably something that if the if Apple goes up as well too, um, that my losses aren't limited. Um, so I don't know. We'll see what I do. Uh, I'm going to look at option pricing today, but I will be in a collar before the end of the day on my Apple shares, and I'll close that bearish trade, which is making money. Well, I have to second your opinion on the collar trade and its versatility. It's the the basis really for what I do uh, in my trading and. You know, why am I out of Apple right now? Simply because I had a nice run for a little while. I'm waiting for a pullback. I, I wanted to put some money into a couple other companies, specifically, uh, to be honest, Occidental Petroleum is where I actually sold. When I sold out of Apple, I bought Oxy. Um, Maybe I should uh, buy some Oxy because I'm going to see Warren this weekend. You are going to see Warren this weekend. Uh, I was just going to say my trade, I'm waiting for the platform to open up. It's yeah. I don't I know. My, my here's my, my Berkshire Hathaway uh, shareholder. Um, anybody want an extra one? I, I got a couple extras here. I, I'll be scalping them out front. Tickets? Who needs tickets? I actually have four extra. That's uh, you, that's Saturday, right? Yeah, it's a Saturday. What do we call? Is it um, capitalism palooza or something like that? Uh, Woodstock for capitalists. Woodstock for capitalists. Something like that. And last year I got you a cap. Capitalist card, didn't I give you that capitalist I card? I, I am a card carrying capitalist along with you now. So here we go. So I will share it and you know, share for those of you that are options animal members, Sunday night I'm gonna do a bit of uh, just when I get back from driving back from Omaha. And then next week I'm sure we'll do one of these and talk a little about anything we learn. Yeah. Good stuff. Okay. Well, it's good to talk again, my friend. We'll uh Get together again next week. Be interested to hear. Maybe we can do a uh, a download on what you learned from uh, Charlie and Warren next week. Yeah, I, I'm going to tell you. I've, I've watched. I've actually during COVID, I watched the whole YouTube thing, or I guess it was Yahoo. They streamed the whole thing. It is completely different being there. So it's if anybody's get has an opportunity, I think you should probably not miss out if you've never seen Warren. It's a little, it, actually reach out to me. You can reach me in the next 24 hours. I'll give you a free pass uh, to get in if you're in Omaha. I'll bring these with me, by the way, if you want to meet me there. Uh, so reach out in the comment section or something. Uh, we'll get you in there for free. But I think you should, shouldn't miss the opportunity to see these li literally living legends. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Cool. Well, we'll wrap it up. Don't forget, folks. Like always, wherever like they are, like, like, subscribe, and uh, and ask us questions. You know, we'd love to uh, interact with you there in the, uh, the the question section as well in the comments. So, thanks for joining today, and look forward to seeing the next one. Bye, everybody. Thanks.